site where you stop in the middle of nowhere because the diesel is frozen. And you somehow don't have the chance to say, this problem is too big, we give up, because you cannot give up, because then you are just there, and you can't just stay there in that night. So you have to do something. So in that situation, you learn a lot about human beings. And I later also realized, actually also something about leadership. Like I said, in my first travel, we didn't acknowledge leadership. We thought we could just do without. Later, I've seen, for example, I, I, I've seen a bus group where it collapsed completely because the teacher was ill. And you can think, why are these young people at 20 to 25 years old, why can't they just do these things alone? But they can't, because leadership is important. So I would say slowly, I have started to realize that it's not true that leadership is not needed. How some more people are coming? And therefore, I slowly start to ponder about the importance of leadership and also what is leadership and what kind of leadership. Because you can do leadership in many different ways, from like no leadership to there is strict leadership to all kind of other kind of leadership. I've also seen we have made data teacher training colleges in Africa also, and I've seen one of my colleagues running a very flourishing teacher training college, very good, and then she left, and there came another headmaster, and in two years, the teacher training college was run down. And it was the same students, the same teachers, the same program. The only difference was actually the leadership. So I think these things have made me think about the importance of leadership. Then I have um, visited many different countries. I traveled in more than 50, 50 countries. And I have visited China, which is an example of a very, uh, you can say, top-down leadership. I think China has a very long tradition for following one leader. And the Chinese population has a big discipline to do so. They have for many, many years had a very strong emperor. Later they got Mao Zedong, now they have somebody else. But they have, they have this tradition of following one strong leader. And you can see this can bring results. The Chinese has built the Great Wall, for example, which is a kind of big effort which comes when many people's efforts are coordinated together. Uh, so you can say there is some strength in that kind of leadership. There are also some weaknesses in that kind of leadership. Because if people are used to follow somebody, they can also go in the wrong direction. You can see the Chinese, if the leader says go that way, the tendency is going that way, and then now we turn that way, then we go that way. And that means you can be led in good direction than in bad direction. And I think we have the most, the, the biggest example, I think, in the modern history of what happens when people follow wrong leaders is a German Nazi, uh, Nazi Germany, which is, I think, an example we somehow all have to say to ourselves, this must never happen again. And uh, many would also say that this also happened because the German population was used to follow one leader, and that is dangerous. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting question, and I don't think it's uh, the consideration stop. I don't believe in one way somehow. I think we need to be open all the time for things how to, to develop. Then I like to study science, um, and I like to study some of the uh, modern theories. They are called non-linear systemic theories. Come from modern, modern, modern physics. Um, where in last century, I think a lot of things happened within science. I think it started with Einstein's relativity theory, which somehow, you know, this, this, this series from science, they influence into philosophy, social behavior, business. It somehow also reflects the way we look at the world, I think. It often start, starts in science. And I would say that Einstein's relativ theories of relativity kind of put a very big question mark to the absolute truth, if there is an absolute truth or not, and maybe there is not. Um, lately, there are these non-DNA theories like uh, hair theory and that. There are many different kind of theory within modern physics. And then I found a book I like very much, and that what I'm going to tell you about leadership is based on that book. It's a book uh, written by a professor in, theo uh, in theoretical physics. He's called Friedrich Kappa. Uh, he was uh, first a professor at Vienna, and later he moved to USA. And he has, in his life, 
studied physics, but also combined the new theories of physics with, for example, the old wisdom, wisdom of the Eastern countries, with China and India and some of the, the Eastern philosophy. Then he finds a lot of similarities. He had written a book about that, which is called The, the Way of Tao. It's a very famous book. What happened? <laughs> Somebody got a message. Somebody? Somebody got a message, I guess. Okay. Oh yeah, but this is our modern <laughs> technology where things happen all the time. Um, then lately he has turned a bit away from physics and more to kind of biology and have studied a lot a very fundamental question that what is life and what characterizes life. And then he has written a book called The Hidden Connections where he compare, like, he takes the theory about life and what characterizes life and then he takes it into our social realm and he takes it also into the business world. We also talk about leadership. So this is what I'm going to, to talk about today. And his main thing is that what characterizes life is that life responds with creativity towards changes. A stone does not do that, but living mechanisms do that. So, so, so that's some, it's, the, it's not the definition, there are many definitions of life, but it's one of the characteristics of life, that life responds cre uh, with creativity. No. Then, from now on, I will go to his book and um, say something about how he sees things, like how he combines these things. And he has chosen to work with business. And since you are from a business college, I thought that was, I could use this here. <laughs> uh, he has studied modern business a bit. Um, and then his main um, finding is that he, he says that, that the top executive businessmen of today, they are under an enormous stress and are complaining a lot that even if they have a lot of power, and their companies have a lot of power. They, they somehow, on the personal level, feel powerless because they, they have to work all the time and they, they cannot take care of their personal life and they are, they are um, changes are coming all the time. And that, that's maybe the, uh, the last thing I would say. I think what characterizes our time is that things change all the time. I think things have changed throughout whole history but what happens nowadays is that things change very, very, very fast. The speed of changes has never been bigger. And that also affects modern business and modern businessmen. Um, and then he has started to think about why is it so? Because his basic theory is that, that like I said, life um, reacts with creativity towards changes. That changes are somehow a good thing. If you take our body, it changes all the time. All the time we eat, we get oxygen, we get water, we put it out again. The cells are substituted, I don't remember how, one or two days I think all the cells are substituted or something like that. So in one way, a lot of processes in our body happens all the time and a lot of changes are going on. And then when some things changes from outside, life also has a very big um, capacity to, to uh, respond to these changes. I think, um, I think that's one of the things which maybe characterize humans uh, particularly, that we are very, very good in responding to changes. If you take animals, then when there come changes, then they either adapt to the changes or they flee, they move. So if, for example, the climate becomes more cold, either the animals will adapt to the coldness or they will go south. Those are the two ways. Humans, they can also do these two things, but they can also do a third thing. They can change back. They can produce clothes, for example, or invent the fire. So they will also start changing the, the world. They will not just adapt to the world, but they will also change the world. So human beings has a very big capacity of coping with changes and the changes. And there he tried to to, um, and he says that a business has a dualism, as a, it has two different things inside itself. Because a business is in one way created for a particular purpose, to create money for the shareholders, for example, to produce a certain thing and create money. And then on the other hand, it's also what you can call a community of people. 
and uh, it's also like a living organism which consists of a lot of people. So it has these two different things, uh, created to make money and created to have human relationships working together. And he see the problems of the modern business in, in this dualism. Um, and then um, he compare, you can, you can manage a business like a machine, and, or you can manage your business as a living organism. And if you manage it as a machine, then you will think that if you can investigate all the parts, here we are also into science, the different, uh, if we can, is this two different directions inside, inside science, if you have a holistic point of view or if you split everything up. So you can study all the different parts and then you can manage all these different parts like you, you can do with a machine. That's one way to look upon it. Or you can manage your business as a community, a people, as a living organism. And there's two ways of managing. The first way of managing this machine way well, it became very dominant uh, during the Industrial Revolution. I think the most famous man, I don't know if you know him, he's called Taylor. He was the one who invented the conveyor belt and he was uh, scientifically investigating the production process and he wanted to split the process in many, many different, in each their little process and then scientifically, scientifically find out how can you do this most efficient. So uh, you can say this is the uh, industrial way of thinking, I think, is to uh, try to manage a business like a machine, believing that if you manage each part, it will be fine. And then there are, I would say, maybe a more modern thing where, uh, where you look more holistic upon the things and where you look at the whole and where you, um, yeah, where you, where you um, can manage believing in people and, and uh, where everybody takes place in the development. That's somehow one, um, one difference, you can say. Then he has studied, uh, he has, uh, there is a, a person from Shell called Eric Gouri or something like that. He has made a study about why, like it is so in, in our capitalist system, you can see a lot of businesses which flourish, go down. New one flourish, go down. That's a very, for example, every time there's a crisis, a lot of companies go down. Yeah. But then this person from Shell, he could see that, that there are some companies, not so many, but there are some companies who survive, who are more than 200 years old, for example, that, that they survive through all these crises. And then he has studied 27 of these companies to try to find out what is it which characterizes these 27 companies who survive all these changes, while all the others collapse and who want to come up. And then he has found uh, three characteristics, I would say. He says that um, in, in these companies who survive, there you can say there is a mutual engagement of the members. As the people, they feel they work for, the common, for a common thing. They have kind of a common goal. Um, and they also have feel that they are taken care of in their personal life. And they have a lot of, um, call it, Shared repertoire of routines, he called tacit rules, that means rules which are not expressed, but traditions, not, not expressed traditions, but traditions you create together somehow. Um, and they are all very open, very open for new members, new people who come to work, and also new ideas. They have a big openness towards the outside, you can see. Um, yeah, he, he called this. A, a community of practice, uh, this is a community of practice, this is a, when people are together in such a setting, and this setting he, he kind of find in, um, in, in these businesses. And there he also sees some, uh, you can say, some formal structures and some informal structures. And the formal structures, they are the one who has written down, and you can find them in the documents, they have these, are, these, are these rules, and then there are a lot of informal structures which are not written down anywhere, uh, but are something created by people. And therefore in these companies then um, then very often when changes come, yeah, that would be nice when, go. When, when changes come, then 
they are very often taken care of at the more informal structures discussed, like in Vietnam, as a media, if I can go back to that example, that, that things are discussed and pondered about. And, and the, so the routine work is taking care of the formal structures, and the new things and the innovation is taken care of by the informal structures, by people discussing and so on. Um, and that leads somehow to this with innovation. Because when things changes, and we now are in a time which changes very much, then you can say, then if we go back to this with life, life has to respond with creativity. And if you have to, to uh, respond with creativity to changes, that means you have to become innovative, you have to create something new. The changes take new things. And there, he has, also, he has studied a lot about life, as what happens when things changes. Um, and when things changes, then there are different processes. And they're, they're, this to create something new, I don't know, some of you have probably tried to get a good idea, yeah? Something a really new idea. But how did, you, how did you get that new idea? So what is it which makes us get ideas? Because ideas are some, something, something new. Yeah? And, and I don't think, I don't know, at least I cannot document how I get ideas. If I want to get a new idea, and I just sit down with my computer and try to get a new idea, I don't get this new idea. I often get the new idea when I'm bicycling. I like to bicycle in the nature, or if I'm in the shower, or if I'm doing something else. And I guess that's because um, ideas comes in a leap, in a jump. Probably you have thought about a lot of things, and then suddenly there comes a breakthrough of that idea. If, you, if the most extreme, this, uh, for example, extremely uh, powerful artist will create this pro, will, will uh, describe this process sometimes as a painful process. Very often you get ideas because you get into a crisis. So you, uh, these artists they work and they, they get into a personal crisis with something, and there's a doubt, there's a doubt and insecurity because something has happened, and, and in this, and then after this whole period, then poof, you get to to something new. Yeah? like a magic moment, um, which of course is a nice thing. Um, and I think which great person get to. And then the rest of us maybe get to it in a smaller scale, I would say. <laughs> but, but if you take, um, if you here come back to leadership, then I think when you are in a situation where things change and where you come in a some kind of crisis, then comes the question, what do you do to get out of it? And I think here comes two ways of doing leadership. So if I now I connect this to, to break through, well, to respond to changes, this has also to do with, with leadership, how, how a community or a business or whatever respond to changes. You can say a leader, uh, he described two types of leaders. Both type of leaders are, you can say, characterized as the leadership that is something about that you can create a vision and you can formulate that vision. I think if you want to provide leadership, you have to be able to, to tell something, somebody, where are we going? Let's say, let us. We're going to India. <laughs> and the students say, we can never go to India because we will break down and what about the desert and whatever. They said, yes, we can. We can go to India. I tried. <laughs> and then they would somehow believe it. That, uh, um, but the first course, the teacher could not say, I tried because he didn't. So there he just said, let's try it. <laughs> so you, but you somehow have to um, yeah, create this vision. Now it's a primitive vision of going to India. It can be many other things. We want to create something, yeah? and this something has to be formulated so people can can get the idea, and and also so they can like the idea, so they'll go for it. Yeah? So it is this to to have a vision and to uh, yeah, to formulate it. Very 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 often your visions you cannot even describe. You 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 often can describe a vision in some metaphors or some pictures or everybody can remember slogans for example. So that's one part of the, what a leadership is doing. That is to to create visions and, and somehow gather people about going somewhere. But then you can do it in two ways. So this characterizes both leaders. 
Then you can do it in this top-down way from China, or this, this other way from Vietnam, if I can take it like that. Because uh, if it's a top-down way, then it's a leader who has the vision, and the other better follow that vision. And then, if you get into a crisis, if you are that kind of leader, and you don't know what to do, then you have a problem. Because you are the leader, and everybody's looking to you, and that's how you create it also. So now, in this crisis, it can be an economic crisis, it can be an oil crisis, it can be is the bad leader. I don't think so. Because I think the truth is not so black and white. And we never know what is right and wrong somehow. But I think it is food for thought, this to think about when you are a leader. And now I don't know what you will do in your future, but um, if you will work with business, you will probably be leaders and maybe some of you will work with something else. But um, whatever you will do, I think you will get into leadership of others. Because, um, and there I think it's food for thought to think about. Do you want to manage whatever you have as a machine, where it's you who knows everything and like that? Or do you want to manage it as a living organism, where you trust in people, and where you, let, where you meet the changes, not with fear, but with, okay, let's go through this together. Um, so I, I think this, this can be food for thought. And also this, if you are giving orders, most people, because I think today we live in a time where people are very independent and they can study on the internet and they have a lot of knowledge and they are wise, I think. People are today, they are wise. <laughs> so most people like that do not like just to be given orders, but they like much more to create themselves. And even if you give orders, if you will, um, you have this that you can, there is a very <laughs> specific form of strikes which you can learn from, I think. You know, you, if you want to bring a company down, you can strike. We stop working. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. There is another form, a very elegant form of strike. In this form of strike, you can bring any company down. And there you say, we just follow orders. <laughs> that will also bring the company down. Because nearly always, if you give people orders, they will also take these orders with creativity. That most people will, if I give you an order and I ask you to do something, then you will very often think, okay, she wants me to do this, but I just modify it a little bit so it fits to the situation. And if you only do what I say, it will probably be wrong. And that is why a, a modern form of breaking a company down, that is if everybody starts to mechanical follow orders and not take these orders with creativity and respond to them, then this thing will crash because orders are never good enough. And this is also good to learn from that, that, the, that people cannot just follow orders. They need to respond with creativity on these, on these orders. Um, and therefore you could also stop giving orders. And you could start, um, if you take this with life again, life responds to disturbances or input, you can say, if you translate to a pedagogical term. So instead of giving orders, you can give input. Because I think leaders and here teachers shall not do what I would call laissez faire. I'm not a laissez faire pedagogy, pedagogy, pedagog. I don't think we should say, okay, like when I was young, I told you, I didn't believe in leaders. So I say, oh, I'll do nothing, people find out. I don't think so. I think you have a responsibility as a teacher or as a leader to, for example, give input. You cannot just leave things. But you can give the right input, and then people can take this input and respond with their creativity instead of giving orders. We had lately, um, just months ago, we had in my school, we had a lot of things to do, the teachers. Uh, a lot of tasks, and we didn't have time to do it. And we, also, some of the things, we couldn't find the solutions. And then in the end, we decided just to share everything with the students. 
And then we made a long list of all our problems. And then, uh, then I fell in that trap of being the only guy, I think. But then I said, ah, the most serious problems. We decided to share it with the students and, and make, put them in groups. And then they could work with these problems. And they said, ah, the most serious ones, they can't solve them anyway. So let's take them away. <laughs> and then some of the others said, no, no, don't do that, trust. I said, okay, yeah, I had the trust. So then, then we said instead, okay, we will not take the most difficult problems away. We will make the whole list of problems, and then they can choose themselves. And then somehow I thought, okay, they will choose all the nice and easy problems. Yeah? But what happened? All the groups chose all the difficult problems and came up with some very nice solutions. And it, I was luckily proved wrong. And it's again this that you have to trust. You have to trust in the in the best. You have to trust that, of course, people are serious people, and they will go to the to the to the serious things. So I think it's a lot of a trust also in other people. Yeah. Then I will maybe just end with a very short. We have made a <laughs> teacher training course in Bissau also. There is a very different culture in Bissau, and then uh, their headmaster. He had taught them two things in English. They, they don't speak English, but they know two things. And the first, they can say, that. the first principle in that, that is find out, and the second is plan can change. So whatever problem they have, he will say, find out. <laughs> and then when it becomes a little bit clear, they will say, yeah, plan can change. And then sometimes the students think there's a little bit too much of all this find out, because it's much more easy to be told. It's, a, it's much more easy if the student, if the teacher tells you what to do, then, then what? So they think a little bit too much of this find out. But um, but on the other hand, that is also what they learn from. And uh, and therefore, I think these two slogans are maybe some very good slogans. This was basically my presentations, and then I thought it would be nice to create some discussions. I, I, I'd like to hear from some of you also, but we could. Should we make a very short break and then you could come back with questions?